My name is Stephanie Alexander, and I am the hatchery manager for the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, for Point Oyster Hatchery. And today I'm just going to give you a quick tour of what we're actually doing here at the hatchery. So the whole process for what we're doing here, which is restoring oysters to the Chesapeake Bay, starts in January. January water temperatures are pretty cold, so the oysters are kind of in a hibernation stage. But when we bring them into the building, we have the luxury of heating up chop tank with water. And by being able to heat the water, I can control water temperature, and therefore we can control their entire reproductive process. So when we bring oysters in the hatchery in January, we put them in our conditioning lab, and this is where we control temperatures up to springtime temps. And the oysters will ripen up and be spawnable in about two months. So if we start in January, we can start spawning in March. Natural spawning season for the oysters tends to be June, July, and August. So we get a huge head start on what nature can do. So when we're ready to spawn them, we will move them to our, our brood stocked table, and this is where we control water temperatures to be more like summertime. We lay them out nice and neat, and we literally stand there and we watch for them to start spawning. We tell the difference by how they're spawning. Males release sperm in long continuous streams from the side, and females actually open up and they clap. And when they clap, they spit their eggs out from the front of their shell. So depending on their behavior and what they're releasing, we can tell if it's a male or a female. We will separate them at this time. They go into a bucket, all of girls and all of boys. And this allows us to know who's who. So we get lots of DNA and genetics, but most importantly, so we can control fertilization. At the end of the entire spawn, which could be three to four hours, we will count all of the fertilized eggs. And if it's a good spawn, we'll have a billion, maybe two billion eggs total. We'll fertilize them and then we will put them in our big swimming tanks and allow them to grow. Larvae have about a two to three week development period. So they go from a fertilized egg to a 300 micron larvae in about two weeks. During that time, we have to take care of them. In the river, they're at the whim of Mother Nature floating around on the current, trying to find food so that they can survive. In the hatchery, we take really good care of them. So while they're in our swimming tanks, they get meals four to six times a day. We do weekly water changes and we're keeping them in a really clean, nice habitat so that they're going to be strong larvae with lots of energy and we'll be able to get food qualities back from them. And at roughly two weeks old, that's when the larvae start maturing. Um, they don't all mature at the same time, it's kind of in dribbles and drabs. But the first thing we notice is this dark spot. We call it an eye spot. It's not a true eye, they can't see from it, but it, we believe it helps them locate where they are in the water column. So at this point, they need to be near the bottom, searching for a substrate to attach to. Second thing they develop is a foot. And they kind of, it kind of looks like they're sticking their tongue out at you. And they crawl around the surface of the shell, searching for a place that they like. They like where they are, they secrete a glue, and now they're stuck. And that's when we call them spatty. The larvae, as they're maturing in the tanks, some are maturing faster than others. So we have to remove the mature ones. So the mature ones will be removed and bundled into coffee filters, and then they typically go in the refrigerator for up to five days. And then the immature ones that are still need a few more days will go back in the big swimming tanks, continue to be fed, and then in two days' time we'll go through the whole process again. So we're constantly rotating through larvae to maximize our efforts. When they're ready to be set, we should recovery partnerships feel crew. They clean shell, we age it, we put it in containers, and then we just use machinery to move it for us. We'll load eight containers per tank, roughly 100,000 shells per tank. We'll fill it up with shell, water, we can adjust temperature and salinity, and we'll introduce anywhere from one to five million larvae into that tank. Once we know that they're set, they look good, we can then do a deployment. And that's when they're removed from the tanks and dumped onto the our planting vessel, Robert Lee. We will dump 10 tanks on the deck of the boat. So this big mound here are all the host shells and attached to those host shells are the spatman shell. And they'll be blown over with a fire hose. Um, you can kind of think of it as mowing a lawn. You just go by and they blow it overboard. In Maryland, we currently have two types of plantings. We have harvest bars, which can legally be harvested at three inches. So that's really good for the economy. And then we have sanctuaries, which are really good for biology. Depending on what our planting is, we will go out and ground truth the site prior to putting the spat overboard. If 
you picture like a soccer field, center half is a muddy mess and we put millions fat in there, they're all going to sink and go and knock sink and die. We don't want to kill them. So we're going out with a dive team through the University of Maryland College Park and they ground truth the site. So we know there's a big pack hole. We can go back and fill it in with good substrate and now we can put the spat on shell back on it afterwards. So we're using science to do what's best for the spat and not just hoping for the best. We're actually going out, looking at what we're putting them into and doing what's right for them.